It's a Broadcasters Association at this station. Back with Vershawn Jackson on 93.7 The Ticket and theticketfm.com. It's the ticket. I'm Vershawn. I'm sitting here with Terrell Farley. We're getting ready to bring in the legend, but before we bring him in, I want to bring him in right. 1987 to 1991, 90. I'm listen, coaching career, Omaha North, Wayne State, Art Bishop Shaw, Tulane, Alabama State, Nicholas State, Central Oklahoma, Desire Street Academy, Langston, Langston head coach, Alcorn State, Grambling, Louisiana Tech, LSU. Now back home at Nebraska, my big brother, Mickey Joseph. Mick, how you doing? V, what's happening, big dog? What's going on? Oh man, I'm so happy that you back in the in the in the state, in the city of Lincoln, coaching. And uh it's just it just brings joy to my heart to have you back in the city, man. I, I don't even know. I, I I gotta ask you something out of the gates. How's it feel to be back? You know what? It's a great feeling. You know, it's a great feeling to come back and then you know to be welcomed back. But um I knew I knew I had a feeling like during the season that eventually I was going to end up back here because that's where my, my heart was at. You know, y'all, you know, these guys in Nebraska, we played at noon, but then when I was at that other school at LSU, we played at six in the afternoon, but I used to watch, just watch the games and I could be so exhausted just watching the games, like these kids playing their ass off, playing hard, you know, just busting their tail, you know, and just watching them play. And just just rooting for them and, and, and digging in every play with them, and and I remember just coming one one Saturday and, and um, Coach O said, "Boy, you you got to start watching the Nebraska game because you been you get exhausted." And and he said it. He said that'd be a good spot for you one day. He said not now because we got work here, but he said that'd be a good spot for you. So you just had that gut feeling and, and you know just to feel just to have the the warm feeling coming back is just a really good good thing. I remember back in 2016 when uh, Devin White, my little cousin, was getting recruited. And uh, I saw you at, I think it was a championship game, Louisiana championship, state championships. Yeah. And uh, I think you were at La Tech at the time. And you were mm-hmm. just getting ready to go to LSU. And I was thinking to myself, you know, boy, how fast time goes by. You know, yeah. with, with Devin winning the buckets yeah. and then you going there and then winning the championship. Talk a little bit about that LSU championship. How was that to to win one? Well, that that's that's for that's a that's a great feeling. You know, some some coaches go their whole career and and they never win a national championship. So that's why you know we you know we can say our our national championships happened in the nineties, but it's something some people have never done. Some coaches have never done. So you still got to look at that with, with with the utmost respect. And respect those teams, and respect those guys that that won that championship, and respect those um those coaching staffs, you know. So you gotta respect that because that's an unbelievable feeling. And and I talked to the players about that. I talked to the receivers about that. I said we we started um, walk through workouts in the weight room, um January tenth. So that was the day of the national championship game. So I told them, I said, are we willing to work for three hundred and sixty five days to the next national championship? Are we willing to work for an entire year? We did that at LSU. We worked for an entire year from, from one one starting point to the last game of the season. And I and I tell them all the time, I said, you gotta you gotta wake up in the morning and you gotta say, Hey, I wanna win a national championship. Because getting now that takes care of the Big Ten championship, that take, that takes care of your side um in the Big Ten. But I, I, I just think that this program is headed in the right direction. I think Frost got it headed in the right direction because I said it. If I, if I didn't think he was heading in the right direction, I wouldn't come. I just would have got me another job down south. But I believe in what what Frosty is doing here, and 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 the guys we have in on offense, the staff we have, and he brings Whipple in. He brings a veteran offensive coordinator in. He brings Donovan in, a, a guy that's connected to the program because his brother played here, and Beck does a good job. And you still have Ryan Brown around, and but I just think the guys that's in this building understands you know what needs to happen here and and what needs to happen here is win is win when you talk about let's let's just talk about how you made it to nebraska being from new orleans who recruited you you were one of the top uh uh even at your size you were one of the top ranked 
just recruits in the nation coming out. How did you, um, how did you make it to Nebraska? Well, I think you know during the recruiting process, you know my dad did a really good job of just of just saying I want you guys to leave the state of Louisiana. No matter what, I want y'all to go see other parts of the United States. And and at the time, I was the option quarterback, so I visited Notre Dame, who was running the option. I visited um, Minnesota, who was running the option, um, Tulane, and then it was Nebraska and OU. And Jack Pierce was the main recruiter, and um, Coach Osborne was the other recruiter. And on the other side, for the other people in that other state, Switzer was a recruiter and Leisha Selman. <laughs> so it was two, it was two against two, you know, mm-hmm. but the, de- the, the decision came down with my mother. Not that she didn't feel uncomfortable with Coach Switzer. She felt more comfortable with Coach Osborne with the, the continue to develop me as a young man. Mm-hmm. If, if, you, if you, if that makes sense. Oh, that makes she sense. trusted that part of it. Because she knew I was going there to play football, she knew all of that. But she wanted to know who was gonna, who was gonna continue to, to develop me as a young man, and and not just a football player. So and she felt like Coach Osborne was the guy, and she said it. She said, "I don't care what it, what you say, <laughs> you're going to Nebraska." You know, and and after a while, just arguing with her and sitting on my bed thinking about it, you know, and she was right. She was right. After you, if you went back and looked at the careers and look what happened at Oklahoma and look what happened here at Nebraska, everything was done here the right way. And, and, and she's seen it. She's seen it from the, the leadership standpoint. And and um, I love her to the day because of that, you know, because she, she allowed Vance to go to Colorado. She allowed Sammy to go to LSU, you know. So she she made me go to Nebraska and, and she because she knew what I needed. So that's how I got here, and, and like like I told, he was telling Mike Grant the other day, you know, we 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 never we never talked about leaving this place. We all when we hear things, it's not easy when you come from Louisiana to Nebraska. It's a different, it's a like a different world, you know. But we never thought about leaving. We we leaned on each other as teammates. We leaned on our teammates from Nebraska. Y'all was from Omaha, you know. We leaned on Eric Anderson family in Omaha and, and Leotis Flowers family. You know, taking us up there, like y'all show us love when we come to Omaha, even you know we out of state. So that that's that's the part that I want to establish too. That when these kids come from out of state, now we got to keep them here, and we will. You know, we will. We'll keep them here. I think I I think uh, Terrell Farley, this black shirt over here, has got a question for you. Hey, Mickey, what's up, buddy? Terrell, how you doing, man? I'm doing all right, brother. Now I know that you're a great recruiter, and um. I did my homework on you. You're probably one of the top five recruiters in the nation. Um, how can we sell these kids back to Nebraska? How can we get these kids to come here, stay here, um, just just do their four years here? Well, I, I think the part, you know, especially with the out of state kids, right? I think it starts. I, I would lean back on our ex players. You know, my, I would lean back on ex players. To, to, to make sure that our ex players are being positive, because one thing, my understanding coming in this building, that our players respect our ex players and they listen to what they say. So if we can be positive with them and let them know that this is a great place to be and and and, and help us, you know, and help us keep them there, you know, I think that we sell that. And then in state, I'm looking at Omaha right now, and. My goal in Omaha and Charles' goal in Omaha is to put a gate around Omaha, put a gate around Bellevue, put, really put a gate around the state and, 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 and make sure that we make the best decision for our football team when we take a kid from in-state. And the same thing with out-of-state kids, that this kid can play here and we, we know that he can play here. And I think that we want to make Omaha a priority, Bellevue a priority, Pavilion, Miller anything up that way, just make it a priority. And I'm going to be up there. I'm going to be up there. I'll be up there Friday, you know, and that's because that's going to, that's my recruiting base. It's, 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 that, it's Omaha, Bellevue, Papillion, the Miller, you know, things of that sort. And, and we got some kids up there. We got some kids up there that can play, you know, we got some kids playing at, at other schools that's not here, you know, and that, and that's another story. And that's not a story for the day. And, and, and my thing is to make sure I'm not making mistakes up there and that, that I'm not missing out on kids. 
you know. But my thing is also they got to be they got to fall under the category we need them to fall under to be able to play here because at the end of the day it's Frost's roster. He he has the last say. It's his roster. We can't let other people pick our roster. I, I, I had to deal with it in New Orleans. Some coaches think, well, he Mickey, he can play for us. He can play for y'all. You know what I you know what I tell that coach? Give me three grand right now. Because if, if he can't play and I get fired, somebody's got to pay that house note. So give me three grand. How much you believe in that kid? You believe in that kid that much? Give me three grand right now and pay that first house note when, when I get fired. And it's, and it's not to be funny. It's to be like, we put a lot of time into recruiting. It's not like we just throw it out there and say, hey, we want this kid, we want that kid, we want that kid. No. We look at film. We, we do background checks. We do a lot. We put a lot into it before we say we want to offer a kid. You know, and my big thing is in-state kids. And if I'm recruiting anybody in state, I need to see you at camp. I need to see you at our camp. You got to show us some type of commitment also. And I think these, these days, they like a lot of stuff. They don't love a lot of things. They like a lot of stuff. So you got to get them to love it. So I got to get out there and sell Nebraska. I got to get these out-of-state kids to love Nebraska. These in-state kids, some of them, I got to get them to love Nebraska, Nebraska again. But I'm going to sell a staff. I'm going to sell a facility that they have. They got a $180 million facility coming up. You know, I'm going to sell a people to build it. Because that, like at the end of the day, Terrell, everybody's going to have buildings, academic centers, stadiums, weight room, nutrition centers. Now it comes down to people in the building. And I think we have the right people in the building. Control the controllables. I think exactly. I wanted what you said. Controlling the controllable. So you get to Nebraska, it's 1987. You get here. What happens at that point? Well, you, you, you find out that it's a very competitive football team. That is a very talented football team. And, and when you arrive, you, you have guys like Steve Taylor, who's a really good quarterback. He was all everything out of California. You have a guy named Cleet Blakeman, who was, who was probably one of the one of the solid, most solid guys that ever been around. Then you have a guy named Jerry Kadowski. You have McCarthy and Clayton. That that was a kid out of Florida that was really good. Then you come in the door. I got Keith and McCant with me. I got Tom Hodge with me. I got, you know, Jerry Dunlap. I remember all those guys. There's like 13 or 14 guys in a quarterback room, you know? So it was a very competitive team. You you had guys like Neil Smith, Roger Thomas, Brian Washington, you know, Jake Young, you know, you, you know Dana Brinson, Keith Young. You had dudes. Keith Clark, you had dudes. You had dudes after dudes. So it was, so what you had to do, you had to compete in practice. You knew if you if you screwed up, that backup was going to go in, and there's a chance that that backup won't come out. And I talked to my receivers about that. We're going to compete within our room. So we're going to try to load this room up with talent. And it's a talented room, but we're going to bring some more talent in. There ain't never enough, ain't never enough talent. You know, I tell people that. There's never enough talent. The best coaches I know who have talented kids. <laughs> That's good coaches. Because they're making plays and they're doing what they need to do. But I, I found out that it's a very competitive program. And it was a program that, you know, when we stepped off the plane, it was it was the mentality was like, how many points we're going to beat you by? And if, we, if it, is, it is a tight game, you do happen to win the game. You knew you was in a fight. And and that's what I respect about the program. And I reassured it. I reassured it. And then, you know, it took you a couple of years to get on the field here. You know, you really, at the, at the time, you didn't have really two freshmen to really start, you know, until I think Tommy was the first two freshmen to ever start at quarterback. I think Tommy was, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think other than that, you had to wait your turn because you had talented guys in front of you. So, like, so let's let's just fast forward now. You're 9-1, and one, playing Oklahoma at Oklahoma. I am, um, mm -hmm. it's 1990. You're number 10. I'm 15 years old. I grew up watching all you guys. I'm from Omaha. I wanted to be a Husker since I was four years old, and I've been playing football for seven years. We're going to – I'm going to ask you about the Oklahoma rivalry. So I'm watching the game. You you dancing back there, doing your thing. You get out of a certain situation and scramble for the first down, go out of mm -hmm. bounds, get hit five, six, seven yards out of bounds. And I was I was crushed. I was crushed just as a little dude. I remember that thinking how much I hate Oklahoma and because <laughs> they was so they cheated, man. They did cheap stuff. And so I'm just asking you, as far as the rivalry that's called Oklahoma, what I mean, and, and just talk about that game and being nine and one and getting knocked out and having to persevere and come back. 
yeah, that you know that was that was that was a dark day, you know, for me and my family just getting hit like that. And and the, and the guy that pushed me is Reggie Boynes. Me and Reggie are friends to this day, wow. you know. But you know, like I said, there's no love loss, you know, between um, Oklahoma and, and Nebraska. It's no love loss, but you know that I, I think. You know, it, it it looked like it was, and, and B, you know how I know you, you're a little more feisty than I, I am. I used to be feisty just like you. I know you like to get after people, but I I think just looking at the play and know the guy, knowing the guy personally now, that he didn't do it on purpose, but it happened. It was gruesome. It was bad. It was a bad day. But you know that Oklahoma Nebraska rivalry. You look forward to that game. You look forward to that game, and, and it, because you knew right then and there that was the two teams that was the top of the Big Eight. And you knew what you was going to get out of Oklahoma, and Oklahoma knew what they was going to get out of Nebraska. They knew it was going to be a battle, and 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 for them to renew that rival, you know that was that was pretty good on their part. You know, and I'm, I'm sure you know we we got some games, we got some games, uh, you know, before we play those guys. But um, I think these guys in this building understand how we feel about that game and how the state feel about that game, and it's um, it's a game where, like I said, it's no love loss. You know, I think it's no love loss. I think you know we all. Ex players, I think we all know somebody play at Oklahoma, and you know, and they they chopping it up, we chopping it up, but we 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 we're gonna take one stop sign at a time, and when we get to when we get to Oklahoma, then you know we'll we have to deal with them, you know. But you know, they have done a great job. Lincoln Riley's done a great job there. Coach Stoops done a great job with that program, keeping that program strong, and um, you know, Coach Venables, who's been a part of that program, he's gonna understand where that program needs to go coming from Clemson and at a high level that they play. So you know, we got our work cut out for us. But you know what, you, you know, and, and, you know, this mentality, what I'm seeing from these kids, these kids won't back down from anybody. You know, anytime, any place, anywhere, I think they have that mentality and they're going to give their all. So we're looking forward to, to playing Oklahoma, you know, but we're also looking forward to playing Northwestern, you know, the um, Dakota teams. We, we're looking forward to playing all these teams. And I think you take one one day at a time, one one stop sign at a time with this, with this, um, with this season. But that's a game that everybody's looking forward to. Coach, you talk you talk a little bit about special teams and your guys playing special teams. Kind of touch on that a little bit. Well, I, I talked to him about it because my my thing is that as, as a receiver core, you're one of the the most athletic groups mm-hmm. on the team, and and in special teams, a lot of that stuff is played in space. So if you're a real good athlete, you're going to be on special teams. So. One thing happened when I got to when I got to the LSU, you know, Ogeron was like, the receivers never play special teams, Mickey, and and I I'm, I'm tired of that, and I, I'm look I'm just I just took the job. I mean I believe in that this should play. So what I did, I put them all on special teams, and the same thing I'll do here. And I, I like I told Xavier, I said Xavier, I don't want you to go down on Gunner and I knock the dude out. I want you to release outside, run full speed, and make the return and pull up. Okay. And I want I want guys to be to be on the front line of kickoff return because you can block in space. I think that it it raises a receiver's value when he can play special teams. Mm. Because my thing to them, if you you're here and you're sitting in this room, one of your goals is to play in the NFL. Because that's one of my my pet peeves that you say, oh, well, you know, I just want to come to college, you know, get my degree. No, I want you to get a degree because that's what you're coming here for in the first place. Let's let's not get that. Let's get that out the way. That's why you're here because you're here to get a degree. But the big thing is that you want to play in the NFL because that's the, that's the highest goal that you can get playing playing football. So the, the increase your value as a receiver, because if you're not the number one guy, because they're only going to dress out four, two, three, and four has got to be on special teams. And I think that I'm going to drive that into my room. I'm going to demand that. I'm going to, I'm going to say this is you are on special teams because I don't be sitting in a special team meeting. So guess what? You're going to be sitting there also. And, and that's part of just contributing to the team. That's part of helping the team win is that the athletic guys are not staying on the sideline. And we and, and we need to have the athletic guys out there playing special teams. And that go with, with starters. They got to be able to play special teams. When you was at LSU, you had a room full of dudes, right? How did you get all those egos under one accord? Because the last guy ain't better than the best guy, and the best guy got to help pull up the lo- the small guy. He's got to come yeah. up. So how did you gel those guys together? I think holding each one of them accountable, and they see that, and they see that you just don't get on 
Jamar that you got on Justin, you get on DJ Chalk, you got in all these kids that's in the league, you know, the, the, just to hold them accountable and, and for me to be consistent with them. And I'm talking about consistent with them like, hey, they do a good job. I tell them, man, that's a great job. I love it. I love what you're doing. I love what you're doing. I love you for that. You know, and being consistent with them. Hey, you got to come out your break. You know, coaching them every play, communicating with them off the field. You know, but and I tell people like this, when you have a talented group, you got to be able to control them. Because I learned a long time ago, if you can't control them, you can't teach them. And my big thing is about controlling them. And they also knowing that they can approach you and having a relationship with them. Having a relationship, have a personal, call them up. Hey, man, how you doing? How's everything? How's everything going home for the family? When they were home for the, for the, for the Christmas holiday, I was texting them. Hey, I hope we work and doing this. Boom, just constantly over-communicating with them. That's that's one thing you got to do. You got to over communicate with a talented group, and they got to know like I can approach him with anything because he's not going to overcoach me. He's not going to judge me, and he's going to tell me the truth. And one thing, he's not going to give me anything. So nobody didn't promise in this room that they're going to start. The, the depth chart in the receiver room is written in sand. It's written in sand. I'm, I can blow it and change it as drop of a dime. And the best, listen to me, the, the best guys are going to play. Yep. Best guy is going to play, and that and that's what I think this group knows that everybody's going to be held accountable. But the best guy is going to play, How's and I think that's fair. Absolutely fair. I mean, that's that's more than fair to say. Hey, you guys are going to come in and compete. I I've never heard that before. That that the depth chart is written in the sand, but I like that the depth chart is written in the sand. Somebody's got to get yeah. it and write it in ink or in blood. One of the two, but. You yeah. gotta write it. Yeah. Right. You're right. How special was Johnny Mitchell? Oh, you know what? <laughs> Coach Brian and I, we were just we were just talking about Johnny yesterday. Like what a what a exceptional athlete he was. That he was able to throw the ball like 70 yards right hand and left handed. That he was able to just to run routes and he was he was such a he was a great dude. He was a great guy, a great teammate. He always wanted to help you. No matter what, what was going on, if you had to say, John, I need your help, he was coming and help you. He was, he was raised by his grandma in Mississippi. I think he grew up in Chicago, but I think his grandma had something to really help raise him. So he was a real respectable guy. But I'm just talking about, you know, and, and he had to come out early. And I remember him coming out early. And he said he didn't want to leave. He didn't want to leave Nebraska early. But he left early and went to the league because – he said his grandma didn't have decent plumbing. He wanted to provide from his family. But man, you're talking about one of the most talented guys. And I tell her tight ends this. I'd never seen somebody more athletic than this kid. I, I'd never seen it. If he was, if he played in this day as a tight end, he would catch a hundred balls every year. Wow. Every year. He would be, he would be considered being to split them out. Because back in the days, you know, we didn't split y'all out. We, we had y'all attached all the time. Mm -hmm. But imagine splitting him out and putting him on a nickel back. I'm telling you, he 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 had an unbelievable talent. Jump balls. Uh, oh, go and get it. He yeah, just said, throw it in the area coach. Just throw it around me. So, Coach, you talked about overcoaching. Explain that. Sometimes you, you can get in your mind as a coach that you need it done the way you ask the kid can do it. And the kid continues and he can't do it that way. But you, you sit him down because you're like, hey, I need you to do it this way. Well, sometimes I'll ask on a slant route, okay, I need you to get to this spot. Just get to that spot. And I, let's, let's go for releases. I want you to move them off the point, the corner off the point and release it. So guess what we do? And you'll, you'll come in one day and I'll show you my drill tape. Mm -hmm. We'll do just do a crossover. We'll just basketball release. So you'll see them. You'll see the receivers acting like they're playing basketball and cross them over. Because I just want to move you off the point. So that's called not overcoaching. Hey, I want you to stick that foot in the ground. I want you to get him in. I want you to get vertical. Sometimes they don't understand that. I was like, play basketball with him, move him in, fake him out. You know, just make it simple for him. And that's not overcoaching. You make it complicated for him because you want it your way as a coach. No, sometimes you have to give in, give a little bit to get what you want with him. And sometimes I learned that. I learned, I learned that from Joe Brady. And Joe Brady came from the Saints to LSU. He said, okay, Mick, we're in this room together. We got some talented kids. We're not going to overcoach you. And I say, explain. And he, and he explained it just the way I explained it. 
And from there on out, I learned not to overcoach. Sometimes the coach, you can think, I know everything. No, sometimes that kid's playing, so he's got to be to tell you what he can do. And then I got to be able to put in my mind to help him. Okay, yeah, he's right. Well, let me let me do this. You know, so that's that's overcoaching to me when you when you want it done your way. The kid continue, he can't do it. Got you, Mickey. I know you're busy, man. I I, yeah. I want to hold you. I want to hold you in the next segment if you want to hang on. If not, man, I know y'all got. Well, I got I got where well, Victor Jones just showed up. My kid from Florida with his parents. So um, I'm sitting here, and I got I got little Miles in here. You got, no, you got little son. B Miles in he, there too. He, yeah, he look. He's he's riding on the board. He's going over his play. Nice. Tell That's him. one thing I got to say about this group now. This group work. This group has done everything I asked him to do. This receiving group and this and this team. Just looking at this team. This team works. This team understands. They going about their business right now. That they 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 got it put in. It, they got it set in their mind right now that they're just going to work. And I told them during the first day. I said, if you work, you win. If you work, you win. And 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 not just working on the field. You got to do what he's doing right now, coming in here in the meeting room, drawing his plays up on the board, and help and helping yourself. Because you know, in this world now, if you show that you can help yourself, people will help you. But if you show you can't help yourself, they don't help you. You know, so all this thing, all this thing reverts right back to life when you talk about the game of football. Mm-hmm. You know, and and that's how that's how we raise them. That's how Scott's gonna raise them in this program. That's what that's got that's got to continue to happen. And I think you know, I've seen kids they walk through the building and come and say hi. You gotta you gotta like that. You gotta love you gotta love it. When they come in just to say hi to you, hey, Cole, what's up? I'm just coming to holler at you. And that's a great – you make you feel good as a coach that you're reaching them like that when they just come to say hi to you and go out their way. You know, because you know as a coach, you really got to go out your way all the time for them. Mm-hmm. You know, but when they go out their way for you, you got to show some appreciation. Absolutely. What's your What's your message to Husker country? I think you guys have been patient. You know, you guys have been patient, and now it's time to win. You know, and I, and I think we're on the right track to do it. I think, you know, just sitting down and, you know, just being talking to Scott and talking to the rest of the staff that, you know, I think the, the game plan right now, you know, is, is a good game plan. And it's to take one section one section at a time. You, you know, they're in the weight room right now. We're doing walkthroughs right now. And all I tell the receivers is just make sure we win the day. Just win the day. And I, and I think that, you know, we, we're on the right track. You know, you, they, they've been patient. You know, we appreciate that. That's why they're the best fans in America. Because they they different, you know they they gonna they they gonna hey we lose they are gonna be upset you know why they upset because they're passionate fans but the best thing about them and they make them different from other fans they're gonna be there next Saturday cheering their butts off again for you other another fan guess what they're gonna do they're gonna sell next week ticket and not go to the game and say how how bad you are these Nebraska fans gonna show, show support they're gonna be they're gonna be they might get angry after the loss but next week they'll be there again I'm looking at the Iowa game it's, it's still ninety seven thousand. Teams three and eight, and they were ninety some thousand screaming fans. Man, you gotta love that. You gotta appreciate that. So now it's time to make them feel good. It's time to make them, you know, let's go to a bowl game. Let's let's get everybody out of here in December and, and go to a warm climate and play. You know, so I think everybody in this building, you know, know knows knows that and knows that and want that. And and I think that we're on the right we're on the right um the right course right now to to, to get that done. Mickey, man, I appreciate you. Big William Washington. I appreciate y'all, man. Yeah. I big, appreciate y'all. Big Will, big Will said he's so proud of you, Mick. And, uh, yeah. man, we I can't wait to talk to you again. I know you're going to put a great product out on the field. I know Coach Frost and you guys are, are gelling and getting things right, go headed in the right direction. So, until we speak again, man, give me your best. Go Big Red. Go Big Red, baby. Let's roll. Let's roll. <laughs> yes, All right. Sir.